All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Taylor Dolezal, a senior developer advocate at HashiCorp, where I focus on all things infrastructure, application delivery, and developer experience. Every week, we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, and they will answer your questions. <laughs> Join us Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. This week, we have Peter and Martin here to talk with us about building, analyzing, optimizing, and securing containerized apps. Uh, this is an official live stream of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat that will be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I'd love to hand it over to Peter and Martin to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Well, hello. Uh, thanks very much for inviting us on. Uh, I'm Martin Wimpress. I work at Slim AI. I'm a senior developer, advocate, and community manager. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Peter. Hi, Pete. Hi, I'm Peter. I uh, work on the growth side at Slim AI. Thanks for uh, having us on and excited to be here. Yeah, so I think if we just sort of dive into the introduction of what we're going to be doing today. So um, as highlighted in uh, uh, a recent CNCF uh, software supply chain best practices white paper, um, tools like Do Docker Slim were used to uh, limit the number of files in container images and thus uh, reducing the attack surface. So while our talk today uh, applies to any OCI compliant uh, container paradigm, uh, we'll be focusing on Docker images, mostly because they're familiar and most prevalent out there. But what we're specifically going to cover is um, Docker file best practice, just at a surface level. We can dive into that in more detail on another occasion. We have done things in that we've done live streams and, uh, and blog posts and stuff on this in the past. We'll be using Docker Slim to analyze the uh, container layer construction. We'll be doing some security scanning of container images, uh, generating a software bill of materials for the container images, and then we'll be using Docker Slim to minify the container and analyze what's changed making comparisons to the analysis we've done with security and SBOM earlier. Uh, and we'll be doing that use by exploring and diffing uh, container images. So uh, that's what we've got on the uh, on the ticket. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that, Pete? Um, no, I think that's I think that's really good. I think, um, you know, what what people will see, you know, I think one of the uh, you know, advantages of this is that, you know, you can run just the code that you need in production. And, um, you know, we have some highlights of uh, potential, uh, you know, security vulnerabilities that you might see in Kubernetes, um, you know, examples of great uh, talks people have done in the past on that. Um, and also some of the drawbacks of, of slimming, right? No great technology is without trade-offs. And so we'll, we'll be highlighting some of those things as well. So excited to, to take it away, Martin. Okay, right. So I'll just, uh, I'll be in the terminal for much of this. Uh, but uh, towards the end, we'll, uh, we'll be moving to uh, a pretty web app. So there we go. That's my terminal. So we're going to start with the Docker file. So um, we're just going to use this so we can see uh, some syntax highlighting. So this is a pretty good start from a sort of um, uh, best practices point of view. So I'm just going to talk through some of the things that exist in this Docker file that are good things to do. Um, first of all, we've um, specifically versioned the base image that we're we're pulling from, and we've even uh, chosen to use a slim base image to keep the size of things down. We've defined our working directory. Uh, when we copy in our assets for our app, our app is very simple. I'll, I'll give you a quick look at that in a moment. Um, we also use the uh, changing ownership process in that copy command. And we, and we specifically pull in the assets that we require so that we don't accidentally leak any tokens or secrets that might be in you know, the app directory. Um, and then we're using some best practice here uh, the pip install is not uh, caching any data inside the container during the run command. And then we've just got some standard boilerplate here. This image is based on Debian. Um, and although we're not doing any apt operations, that's a bit of boilerplate that I always have at the end of, uh, uh, of those scripts to clean up and make sure we're not leaving any cruft behind. 
then we're choosing to run our app um, using a non-privileged user. We're exposing the port that the app works on. Uh, and that's also useful for the um, sort of discovery process that Docker Slim does. And then we've defined a tight entry point to our application as well. So these are all good things. And there's a couple of links at the top of that, if you can see them to, you know, uh, a blog post that um, uh, I published earlier in the year, which covers this in a bit more detail. And also because this is a Python app, a link to um, uh, an article from Python Speed where they specialize in Python inside containers. So, um, Pete, anything you want to dig into on that one? Uh, no, I guess just a note for the audience that this is a Flask app, which is you know one that we've done on our our Twitch stream in the past, so uh, might be familiar. I see uh, Yannick is in chat, so hello, French guy, and uh, you know you you may have seen this example before, but um, it's a pretty simple, basic app. But for us, the app isn't super. Uh, interesting in that we can do this with a node container. We could do this with with several different containers, and um, you know we're just using this as a very basic example because a lot of people are familiar with the framework. So yeah, yeah, it's just got two endpoints, uh, root and hello, and that's all it does. Now the app, it, like Peter says, the app isn't important, but the two entry points will be. We'll use those as examples a bit later on. So that's the app. That's the Docker file. Um, I suppose the other thing to point out is a lot of people sort of um, advocate for starting with things like Alpine if you want to make slim, minimized containers. Uh, we've chosen not to do that here. Um, there could be different reasons for doing that. If you are a developer that's uh, specifically um, knowledgeable around Ubuntu or Debian, you may choose to use a base image that you're familiar with uh, to help with you know, developer momentum. Or um, it may be that you are aware that using something like Alpine could actually introduce some unexpected behavior in your application or your language ecosystem, which is actually something that can happen more, more often than not with Python apps. So we are using uh, not using Alpine on this occasion. Now, you can still slim Alpine uh, images as it happens. And what we're going to be demonstrating here is a reductive process to creating minified containers as opposed to an additive process that you would go through with something like Alpine as your starting point. So um, let's have a look. What have we got here now? Um, well, one of the things I can do is we can lint our Docker file with Docker Slim. So let's just lint that Docker file. Uh, we'll get some output there, uh, and it will generate a report file for us, which is just here. So if I cat the uh, report file, we can see that it's um, it's analyzed 24 things that we haven't fallen foul of, but we have actually got one finding, and that's that we have no Docker ignore files. There is room for improvement in the way that we've structured our um, our container here. Um, so we're um, we, we can do better there, and maybe next time we'll make sure we have a Docker file, <laughs> a Docker. I think, a somebody, Docker I think somebody in the chat already called us out. So one thing, and I know that we we mentioned this in the blog post that you talked about. So uh, uh, Exegete IO points out that we should um, copy app in after the uh, pip install in the Docker file, which is a an improvement for the the layer caching, right? So um, as we're making changes to our application, those are going to be more frequent. Uh, we're right. not going to change the underlying dependencies as much. I know we talked about that in the uh, blog post, so good catch and um, slight improvement there as well. So yeah. Uh, right then. So with that, let's move on to uh, the the very basics. We'll we'll build our um, uh, Docker um, image here. So let's think now. Um, we'll call it uh, prod fat. Uh, so this is our fat container. So there's nothing here that anyone wouldn't expect to see. Um, so Docker images, and there we have. So our base, base image is 122 megabytes. And by adding our app and dependencies, we've now got a container that's 133 megabytes. So that's not too shabby. Um, and I will run my app very quickly. You don't need to see what it displays in a browser. What I will do is, uh, oops, what have I done here? Oh, I've missed a, a letter off there. So I will just go over here very quickly. And I'm, uh, 
he says. <laughs> I am, as you can now see, poking at my application. Uh, and I can also hit the other URL, which is this one. So there we go. That's the entirety of, of what that app does. And there it is running, which, which comes as no surprise. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate something that we have um, we see quite regularly, and that's container images that make their way into production that have still got um, development tooling inside them. So we're going to um, sort of create a, a simulation of that. So I have another, another Docker file here. I'll just diff the two Docker files. I have Dockerfile and Dockerfile.dev. So Dockerfile.dev, I know there are better ways of doing this, but this is purely for illustrative purposes. Um, this Docker file does an apt update and then installs the three essential developer tools, the fish shell, Git, and the world's best editor, Nano. So there we go. Our, our developers are now super happy because they have the ultimate in you know iterative development environments locally on their machine. So we will um, build that um, dev container for the purposes of comparison. Um, and we'll call that dev-fat on the tag there. So we'll, we'll build that. We don't need to run it, um, but what we will do is we will have a look at um, what that's done to the size of the container. As you can see, it's doing quite a bit more. Oh, goodness, I can't type for toffee today. Right, there we go. So now that um, dev container is 271 megabytes in size. So that's um, a container we'll be using for some comparison processes a little bit later on. Now, what we're going to quickly go through here is um, scanning um, uh, Docker containers or containers generally for um, security vulnerabilities. Uh, and also to generate SBOM. Now we could use uh, Docker scan to do that. You've probably uh, seen that. We're going to use a couple of uh, different tools. We're going to use Gripe. So uh, Gripe is a vulnerability scanner for container images and um, also for file systems. So we're going to scan our prod fat container and we're gonna see what this generates. So here's our, our um, vulnerability list. It tells us that 114 packages have been catalogued and there are 67 vulnerabilities. Most of these are low or negligible with some you know, mediums and criticals hiding away in there. What have we got here? This looks like an interesting one. Uh, libgcrypt, libgnu, tls. Okay, so there's a bunch of CVEs in here different statuses. Now you should run these types of um, scans and analysis before you slim a container. So you get an overall picture of what was used to construct that container. Um, the slimming process removes some metadata from the container and that limits the effectiveness of these scanning tools. So we do the scanning now on the on the full fat containers, and then we'll store, well, we're not going to do that, but you should store and publish this metadata alongside those images. So you've got a record of what was used to compose them. So that's um, our security scan done there. Let's just take a look and see what that, 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 that looks like if we do the same on uh, our dev container. So um, what have we got here? Um, 185 packages, 120 vulnerabilities. So that's uh, another 71 packages included in that image and uh, nearly double the number of vulnerabilities. Um, so just by including some dev tools, we've increased the potential attack surface inside our, um, our container. Perl is installed now, yes. <laughs> um, so we can do the same thing uh, with uh, Trivi, which is another vulnerability uh, scanning process. That's going to tell us much the same sort of thing. If we just look at the uh, sort of edited highlights here. Oops. Uh, yes, that's correct. So um, we can see the package here. We, we can see there were 65 
um, 59 low, 2 medium, and so on. And we can do the same for our dev container. And, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, it finds more stuff as well. So you can use those two tools to, um, you know, get um, CVE analysis uh, from your containers. And then the other thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to use a tool called SIFT, which is uh, a tool and library for generating software bill of materials for container images and file systems. So uh, this is another open source project from uh, the same camp as um, um, Gripe. So let's take a look at this. We'll do the production container and this will build us a nice big list. And you can see here the difference between those things that are DEBs that were installed as part of the distro versus those things that are Python packages that were pulled in via pip when we constructed the container in the Docker file. So that's looked at 114 packages. And this tells us the packages that are included in the version. So this is you know, a, a really easy way to generate that. And then uh, we can do the same thing against the um, dev container. And you know, to the surprise of no one, there is more stuff in it. Um, one of the interesting things in here is as a result of installing those dev tools, we now have um, Open, the OpenSSH client installed. So what we've done is we've put a very interesting tool into our container image that any would-be hijacker would be delighted to find, you know, inside that container for using for island hopping or things of that nature. You know, we've, we've seen this recently. There was a talk at, um, which event was it, Pete? Was it Cloud? Cloud days? Uh, it was container days. Container um, and days, that was it. Similar talk at uh, Cloud Native Rejects right before KubeCon. So. Yeah, and uh, it, it was um, a slightly sort of staged example, but uh, it made a very good point about where defaults are changed and the behavior of a Kubernetes cluster is altered. And then you have an application that has a bug in it, effectively. It was uh, unsanitized uh, user input. And from that, they were able to um, uh, create a reverse shell because inside the container image in the cluster, there were shells, there was curl, and just enough tooling to uh, create re reverse shells and provide the tooling to somebody mm -hmm. to actually poke at the uh, APIs of Kubernetes and then disrupt its operation. So um, what we're going to be looking at in just a bit is where we minify the container is removing that unnecessary tooling that exists inside the container images to reduce your tax services. So in that same situation, yes, your application may still have that bug inside it, which means that you know somebody can you know overflow the uh, the the application, but then none of the tooling exists in the container that they can actually island hop or go any further with that exploit. So that's yeah. that's the the benefit here. Yeah, Martin, we've got a couple of questions from the chat, so I, th I think sure. we may take them in, in a couple of orders. So just as a reminder, so Anchor, and, or sorry, uh, as you mentioned, Gripe and Sift, um, you know, they're supported by the, the company Anchor. So, you know, they're great open source tools. We have a question about open source projects for beginners who are still learning. So I think if you're just getting started with containers, you know, kind of creating containers, um, you know, that have a simple application in them is just a great way to get started if you do the sort of, Docker, hello world type of examples in whatever programming language that you use. Um, or you can actually just take any hello world tutorial. So right now I'm learning Rust, right? There's a great Rust container out there. I don't really know how to use Rust, so I have a hello world app. I can containerize that in a pretty simple Docker file. And then I can run some of these tools on them. I can use Docker Slim to try slimming that container. Um, I can use these open source tools that we just showed from the Anchor company, um, you know, Sift and Gripe to generate an SBOM and do a vulnerability scan. I could use the Docker scan vulnerability scanner to see sort of what's inside them and what might be vulnerable there. Um, at Slim AI, we have a free web platform that you can actually pull that container. You can look at just the Rust container and see what's inside of that, or you can actually pull your own application from Docker Hub or Amazon ECR. So if you're new and you want to get started with some of this stuff, like just creating a very simple Hello World container 
is a great way to get started and do that in the application that you're the application language that you're most familiar with. So um, are you rusty if you are more or less familiar with the Rust language? I believe you are. I believe it's a uh, Rustation is is what it, they let you. They give you that tag as soon as you do the, the hello world example, which I finished this morning. So yeah, we're all rusty. Um, <laughs> Someone else is asking what exactly happens during the slimming process. I think we'll get into that, right, Martin? We so will. you're going to show Docker slimming. So that might be a good segue into the next thing. So, so great questions. Please keep the questions coming. So, indeed. So uh, I just need to pick up my uh, terminal again. There we go. There we go. Right then. So um, if we, what we're going to do now is we're going to use um, Docker Slim. Uh, it has a feature called X-Ray. We're going to use that to sort of uh, generate some analysis on the layer construction, and we're going to take a little look at that. So um, Docker Slim um, and then X-Ray. Uh, we're not going to export all the artifacts just yet. We're going to scan our production container, and we're just going to output all of that into a text file so that we can go and look at it. Um, and I don't have Visual Studio Code, so it will have to be the ever-wonderful Nano. So as you can see, this is quite verbose output. But there are some things. If you, if you look through here, you can start to find some interesting strings. So one such string is this one. Uh, which is uh, info equals layer dot start. So if we look through the file, we can see the start of each layer in the construction here. So we can see details about how each of the layers was put together. So we can see the instructions that were run here and the object count and things of that nature, the size of things that were added. You know, this one's particularly interesting. There's a lot that went on here. So we can see inside here and see quite a lot of information. And we can also, you know, do things like um, find the um, exposed ports, you know. So the information's in here. Now, I do realize that this is a not particularly human friendly way to sort of visualize that data. So what you can do is this. You can um run this x-ray command and you can export the artifacts um so we'll do we'll run that again here and what that has created is this file here data artifacts.tar and what you can now do is you can go to um, portal.slim.dev and you can upload that tar file and it will generate you a Technicolor web view of that analysis. And it turns all of that sort of machine readable data into consumable information. Now, I'm not going to go uh, to the website and do that just now because the process of switching between web and terminal is a bit um, tricky for me today. So what we'll do is we'll save all of the visibility stuff with the web app until a bit later and we'll look at um, we'll look at all of the container exploration analysis and diffing features all together uh, a bit later on and hopefully that will help answer some of the questions about what exactly happens when uh, a container is slimmed yeah, so and that's I think that quite the the question and the point that we got before from uh ex io um who pointed out that you know the layer construction would actually be a little better in the docker file if um you know we installed the dependencies before we copied the app over you know that's a good place to see that in this sort of layer mm -hmm. construction from the docker slim x-ray export um also you can see it in the in the web platform at slim ai so uh, yeah. Sam Frankie asks, is, it looks like a good command of Linux helps a lot for Docker. Martin, do you have a comment on that? Looks like a good command of Linux it helps a lot. Um, not necessarily. I mean, um, I'm comfortable, you know, in a terminal. But, um, I mean, the Docker commands and the Docker Slim commands, I think Docker Slim only has four main primitives that you need to learn. Um, it's build, lint, uh, x-ray, and profile. You know, so, you know, it, that's not too complicated to learn. And once you start to get familiar with the tools, uh, you know, that they, they come off the fingers quite quickly. Um, uh, but I think, you know, um, we're, 
there's there's enough complexity but enough simplicity in a few of the basic primitives for docker and docker slim so um we're um, now going to take a look at slimming you know the container um so there's a couple of things to point out here um a lot of people have sort of uh, been treating container size as like a vanity metric um and that's really not the case so um the size of a container can be used as an indicator as to the quality the quality of that container and how well maintained it is it's not the be all and end all but it's an indicator of container quality and that's certainly something that we're looking at working on in sort of trying to take some of these indicative metrics around containers and turn that into sort of a health report um, you know, using more than just container size, but also that security scan, the software bill of materials and, and various other things. So uh, slim, we'll slim the container and we'll, we'll do this. Uh, I'll explain what each of these um, parameters or arguments do. So we're calling Docker slim. We're asking it to build a new container. We're going to call this container slim demo with the tag prod slim, and it's going to be using our prod fat container as the source. So we're going to run this and see what happens. A bunch of stuff comes out on the screen here. I'm going to highlight a few things. So the first thing you can see is waiting for the HTT probe to finish. So what's happened is, is that Docker slim has injected an observer inside the container. It runs the container and the observer analyzes everything that that container hit, touched, or used in order for that application to run. And it's very much worth pointing out that this is a very key bit of information up here. So the HTT probe commands, there is a count of one. It did precisely one thing. It did a single get request on the root of the application. Um, and I understand that is probably not sufficient for most people. And we're going to get into some of the other things that you can do, because I appreciate our application is probably not as interesting or complex as yours, but we'll show you how to build out how that probe works. So the other interesting metric here is it has minified our container by nearly six times. The original was 133 megabytes and our optimized container is now uh, just 23. So uh, let's just confirm that with Docker images. And indeed, here is our prod slim container, 23 megabytes versus 133. So we should probably run that and run the prod slim container. Uh, there it is. There's, you can see the terminal output. I'm just heading over here. I'm now going to poke at my, there we go. You can see me hitting the root of the app and then I'm going to hit hello one, as well. So there we go. One, one thing to point out as well is that you used the Python slim container as the base image, which is again, the sort of minimum container from the Python community that has nothing to do with slim or Docker slim. Um, that's the Python community's image. That's kind of the bare minimum of Python tools that you would have. Uh, so that's what, why that's like 120 megabytes. And then we're reducing that mm. down into 25 megabytes. If you were to use Python latest, as your base image, which is you know, uh, you know, kind of the the most generic one, um, you know, that might be a gigabyte, and you would still sort of be able to slim down to this this type of uh, magnitude. So, yeah. So um, we've just talked there about it did a single thing. It will do a get request on the root of the app, and then it will attempt to crawl any URLs it finds uh, as a result of that process. Which, of course, for a RESTful API it may or may not find anything at that point. So we're going to look at a couple of um, additional commands we can use. There's one which is called, uh, I will just put this here. It's the HTTP probe command. So what we can do is if you've got a simple app like mine, you can add additional probes to that set of HTTP probes. So here is a... Um, I'll just call this um, probe one <laughs> for the for the purposes of this. 
Uh, oops, no, I've put that in the wrong place here. Let's just call this P1, that's easier. So um, we're adding this here. So my app has another endpoint under slash hello. So what this is doing is adding this additional um, um, endpoint to the probe. So if we run uh, this process, we're slimming that same container, but this time uh, we will see that in fact two probes ran as part of the uh, discovery process. Here we can see um, that the count was two and it was get on hello, get on the route. There was a count and we can see that they were both successful. Now this is important. If I, if I just did uh, the probe on the root of the app, there is a possibility that that doesn't exercise all of the code paths and pull in all of the dependencies of the application and therefore the resulting container won't be fully fu functional. But by making sure I've hit all of the endpoints, I've exercised all of those code paths and made sure that any dependencies for the whole application uh, get taken into account in the uh, minified container that it creates. Yep. But I appreciate, mm -hmm. go on. I was just going to say, kind of getting back to um, Avinash's question of like what happens during slimming. I think that's what you're kind of explaining right now, which is the, you know, the container runs. And and again, I think we should say that there are a lot of different approaches to slimming, and we're showing sort of the Docker slim approach to slimming, which is to try to automate it and really understand everything that's in the container. I think slimming at a at a high level is this notion that you should only ship to production the things that you absolutely need to make your application run. And making that perfect is, is pretty difficult to do, right? So, you know, multi-stage builds do this to a certain extent. Distro lists and build packs are a certain approach to, to tackling a similar problem. Docker Slim, really, the way it works is to run the application, stimulate that application in certain ways so that it can see everything that's running. And it's a mixture of static and dynamic analysis. And then what it's going to do is rebuild a functionally equivalent version of the container, which is what Martin is just doing right now. And with these flags that Martin's showing, the they're just different ways to sort of better run the container so that Docker Slim can be smarter about what it keeps and what it can what it can take out. Right. Um, and if you've got a, a more complex application than this, and you have many endpoints, and maybe it uh, responds to more than just get requests, then uh, you can group together lots of different HTT probes in a single file. So I will show you the very simple one that I have. In fact, let's, let's use this for colorization. So I have a file here, probe.json, uh, and it has a couple of commands in here. Protocol is HTTP. The method is get, it hits the root, and again, HTTP get, and it hits hello. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be that you have many of these and you want some of these to be post. You need some of them to be HTTPS. You can also invoke the crawling should start on this particular URL, and it will go and you know mine everything south of that URL. So there's a whole bunch of um, different methods and capabilities that exist here, and you can build that out. Or mm -hmm. you can also um, generate a file which can have lots of um, curl commands, for example, inside it, and it will run. It will run those curl commands during the observation stage, and maybe instead of curl commands, you have integration tests. So you can actually, and this is the best way to actually make sure your application in, is properly stimulated is to call your integration tests whilst the container is being observed for minification. But I will run this with my very simple um, set of um, commands here. Bernard, Bernard asks, and we get this question a ton, so I, th I think it's good to address, uh, you know, can you get into a situation uh, where you execute all the endpoints, but um, you know, to paraphrase a little bit, like, is it possible that you miss something? You know, and I, it, I think at at certain stages, it's a little more art than than science. You know, you certainly don't need to create a new probe for every single endpoint with every single variable across your entire app. Um, but a, a common thing for people who are just brand new to Docker Slim is they just do kind of Docker Slim build, and they they do that on their container, and suddenly it stops working. And that's what all of these flags, and if you go to the 
uh, Docker Slim GitHub repo, you can find a full list of, you know, I don't know, there might be 300 different flags that, you know, the, the contributors have built into the project over time um, that really help you sort of tune what that minification recipe looks like. So if your app is really, really complicated, you might need more flags. If it's really, really simple, it might work better out of the box. Um, but the goal of Docker Slim is to be able to really minify any app. Um, it's just that your mileage may vary depending on how complex your app is and, and at what points, um, you know, different code gets executed. So, yeah. And, you know, something else that we're working on is to take that, um, rich set of tooling that exists within Docker Slim. Hello. It stopped screen sharing. Uh oh, let me try that again. <laughs> Uh, oh, this is difficult. Um, oh, okay. It doesn't want to share my... Oh, there we go. There we go. I had a good hard thing You're about back. it. All right. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that there is that rich palette of, of tooling in order to craft, you know, a Docker Slim command that will, um, that will uh, work for your application, but we're trying to simplify that and turn that into a much uh, simpler process for actually building out the, the means by which you can probe your, your container. So I, I have this here, we're doing another build um, and we this time we're going to use that um, JSON, probe.json there to, to build it out and we will see that it will run um, run that in order to execute those probes. Um, what we'll be looking at a little bit later is uh, the impact of this minification process. So we're going to do one other thing now. We created that dev container earlier that had additional tooling inside it. So we're going to go and build a slim version of that container because this uh, demonstrates a capability, sort of a user story uh, that we often uh, find people find valuable. So I'm building the um, a slim container from our dev um, Docker file, which included those additional dev tools. And I've also included the extra HTTP probe command there just for sort of completeness. And if we do um, Docker images here, you'll notice that our prod slim and dev slim containers are exactly the same size. Now, the reason why this is important is because one of the advantages, well, one, yeah, this is just one of the advantages of Docker Slim being a reductive process. And one of the reasons why Docker Slim was created is you have developers who are already got a familiar set of development tooling and a workflow, let's say based around Debian in this case. And they want to create smaller containers because they want to reduce the attack surface and all of those other good things. They want to increase the time or decrease the time it takes to, to deploy in, into production and smaller containers are faster to deploy, faster to start. And somebody suggests, well, you could start with Alpine, but then you have to relearn a whole bunch of new platforms and tools and developers are already universally time poor and asking them to learn another another thing and another thing and another thing and change the way that they work is harder than introducing something that just augments what they're already doing. So what we have here is the idea that you can have fat containers for developers that are fully instrumented with all of the dev tools and all of the creature comforts that those developers want in order to iterate fast locally. But then you can put those containers through your CI CD platform through Docker Slim to create these small containers that have got all of that tooling removed so that they can then be pushed into production at, with. Uh, you know, that reduced attack surface and those efficiency benefits. So that's sort of the user story that we see quite a lot with people that are using Docker Slim. Is there anything you want to add on that, Pete? Um, no, I think that's I think that's a great point and, and really illustrates what we've been talking about. Um, we got a question, can Docker Slim work directly with tar image files? We use Basil to build images resulting in file artifacts 
rather than having images in our local Docker registry. Um, yeah, because what you I could do is you could use you could you could have your Docker file use from scratch, import your tar file, and then do the Docker slim process. You know, once you've built that initial image from your tar yeah. file, I think that would work. Yeah, one caveat question we get a lot is, um, does it require Docker at all? And the answer to that is yes. So Docker Slim is a binary that you download and it's on your your local machine or you can put it on whatever machines like, um, you know, a lot of people build it into their CI pipelines and stuff like that. It can run as a container as well, um, but it does rely on the Docker daemon to do its thing and run the image and understand it. Now what you get is an OCI compliant image. So you run that on whatever you want, um, but there is that requirement. So people that are, you know, just, allergic to Docker for whatever reason, you know, um, you know, probably won't work, but if you have a different runtime, that's fine. If you have a different development process, it's usually fine. Um, and there is a containerized version of Docker slim that you can run as a sidecar as well. So, uh, qu question, are there restrictions on the stacks it supports? I see a lot of languages listed. I do a lot of .NET, which is not, um, our .NET expert is in the chat. That is Big Pod. He can tell you about uh, his experiences with .NET. So I will let him answer that question because I am not a .NET person. Um, the goal of Docker Slim is to work with any language. So any container, um, any language, I'll say, you know, works really, really well right out of the box with, you know, kind of web server style applications, APIs, websites. So Node.js containers, Python, Flask. Django, stuff like that works super, super well. Obviously works really, really well with Go. It's written in Go. Um, you know, uh, it definitely works with other languages, but you know, um, the levels of complexity and the sort of results you get can vary a little bit. Data science containers work, but they take a little bit of, of doing. Um, you know, they're also humongous. So some reductions in those is, is usually a pretty big benefit, but we've done them in R and with uh, kind of Jupyter style Mm. Uh, data science containers, but you know that's a little bit of a further out there use case. So, yeah, give it a shot. Let us know what you think. We have a Discord um, for both Docker Slim and we have one for Slim AI. So, if you have questions or if you want to give it a try yourself, please drop into those and let us know. We're always looking for good examples and ways to improve it. So, right then, uh, great, let me share my screen there. again. Um, let's pick up this. Okay, we'll just wait nicely. So here we go. So um, uh, here I am logged into uh, the Slim Developer Platform. And what we're going to do is we talked about exploring and diffing containers. And I talked about, you know, you can upload your X-ray reports. Well, that's right here on the home page. Once you're logged in, it even tells you the command here to, you know, generate your um, X-ray report. And then you can just upload it here. Now, I'm not going to show you this because we're going to go into more detail in a couple of other areas. So what you'll see at the top here is connectors. What I decided to do is I pushed my fat and slim container images to Docker Hub. Um, you can use uh, a number of different registries. We'll take a look here. Um, if uh, we look at mine, you'll see that I have mine connected to Docker Hub at the moment, but you could use GCR, ECR or key. So there we go. That's that there. And you just, you know, I'm not going to go through this whole process, but you click connect, you plumb in some information, you hit save and you're connected. So I pushed my fat container and my slim container to Docker Hub earlier. And what we're going to do now is uh, then I added them to uh, my favorites. So I, I will show you how I did that. They're already there, but you can click on this ad, and then I can see what's inside my connected repositories. Here's our slim demo, and here are our two container images. And I connected those up and added them to my favorites earlier. So if we go back to the favorites here, here is the slim demo, the prod slim, and here is the slim demo, the prod fats. This is the fat container. So let's start with the fat container and we'll click this here to analyze and view uh, this container. Uh, and we'll pull out a few things that are worth looking at at the uh, uh, sort of a high level. So you can see here all of the layers that were used to construct this container. But if we just look at the overview very quickly, 
Um, we can see, you know, the user, we can see what it's built upon, we can see what ports it exposes, the size, um, the working directories and all of that good stuff. And then down here, we can also see the shells that are included. This is an important bit of information. Again, when we're talking about that whole, you know, containers being hijacked through to through you know um, bugs in software and we can also see the files that have got special permissions and certificate bundles and a whole bunch of stuff so at a high level you can you know easily and this is what was inside that x-ray report that was sort of difficult to um, sort of scan as a, as a human but if we now look across at the file explorer here we can see this is a view of the container um, for, with all of the layers applied. But if we step through this, we can look at layer zero and we can actually expose what commands were used to generate that layer. Now, this is obviously coming from the base image. We ingested a base image. But I think the first five layers of this uh, container are actually what we inherited from the base image. So you can even analyze, you know, what actually happened, you know, in the construction process um, before you, you know, ingested it as a base image. So here we can, uh, well, that's all going to be one thing. So let's do this. We can see here that um, one file was added, but it gets interesting when we get along here. I think layer seven is where we install our PIP requirements and we can see the 832 files um, get added and they all, you know, sit in around here. Oops, I didn't mean to click on that, but you can click on anything. Um, and it, it shows you everything that's in here and you can, you know, filter this down to, well, I know Flask was something that got installed, so I can just look at the things that were added as part of Flask. So this is a nice way to look at the doc, at the at the uh, sort of the whole image. This is the fat container, remember, and it also fully fleshes out the Docker file, including all of the full verbose steps that we inherited from the base image. So you can see precisely how this container was put together. So this gives you a sort of a degree of visibility that um, you might not ordinarily have. Um, is there anything else you want to add on that, Pete, before I? No, I think so. Are we going to look at a, a diff? Is that? Yeah, so uh, we will look at a diff. Um, I was just going to very quickly look at the slim container because there's a couple of things in the overview that are worth pointing out here because of the reduction. So the first is the slim container is a single layer container. It has been reconstructed with just the raw ingredients that it requires. Um, and in the uh, overview here, we can see there are no shells inside this container, that there is only the temp directory with any sticky bits ap applied. You know, so you can immediately see a lot has changed and you can go through the file explorer process. Now, obviously everything's in a single layer at this point. So it's more interesting to, as Pete says, uh, go and take a look at a diff between the slim and fat containers. So we'll just do that now. Uh, we'll compare them. We'll select the fat container to the slim container and then compare. <clears throat> So we're looking at a file system diff here uh, from fat to slim. We can see uh, what was removed. So we can see that in the slim container, the requirements.txt file has been removed because, well, the, the minified container just simply doesn't need that to operate. We can see all of this user space that's just you know, now absent. There's obviously tons of stuff that's been thrown away, but we might want to actually sort of dig into this to uh, sort of, let's think about some of those scans we did earlier. I think we 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 knew that libgnu tls was one of the things that had a vulnerability. Well, if I filter this list, we can see, well, that library has been completely removed 
in the slimming process. So that if we are asked, um, are we shipping this version of LibGia new TLS in our production images, our bill of material says, well, yes, we do. But then this tool enables you to go and look at the slim container and actually come back with the answer, no, we are not. The, the, the slimming process is removing this. And similarly, we, um, we know that SSH was added. Um, that's probably a bad, bad way to search for that. Is it that? I can't even remember what the libraries are. No, a bad example. Okay. But <laughs> you get the idea. You know, yeah. when, we, when we search for things, we can see that the shells have been removed. So you can look at that software bill of materials. And similarly, we know we included Flask. But we can also see that some of Flask has been removed because it's simply not used by our application. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think kind of to Avinash's question before about like, well, what's happening during this process? And, you know, to some of the other questions about like, well, aren't there risks that this gets removed or that gets removed or um, something that I need? Uh, you know, I think that was part of the idea behind um, Slim AI and the platform and, and why we're building this to help sort of debug this slimming process, no matter what containers you're using, if you're using Docker Slim, if you're using um, some other type of container approach, just to give you some more insight into that. Um, you know, if people want to see more of the Slim platform, like feel free to go check it out. It's free, you know, to sign up. And we do a lot more in-depth stuff on the Slim platform on our Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash Slim DevOps. So that's a good place to to check it out yeah. um, if you want to want to see more there. So um, and I think that is sort of the 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 main sort of you know pieces that we wanted to to show there. So, yeah. you know, what we've gone through is <clears throat> looking at some best practice with the Docker file, uh, it looks like uh, we've still got some learning to do there. Thank you for the hot tips <laughs> <laughs> earlier on. Um, but starting with that process, starting with what is a decent a decent looking container, uh, doing some security analysis, some S bomb generation, and then slimming those containers and analyzing what happened as a result of that slimming process, and then. Uh, how does that relate to the software bill of materials that we were generated? You know, are, are, if if we are asked the question, are we shipping library X Y Z in our production containers? We can trivially go and find out the answer to that question. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Martin. That was super cool. Um, if uh, people in the chat have any questions or want to see anything else, again, um, you know, you can find us at Slim DevOps on Twitter or on Twitch, and we do a lot of these demos and show more of the platform and do some Docker Slim examples. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, just reach out. Taylor, any yeah. questions on your side? Yeah, I think kind of just more of a you know fun fun kind of exercise. Have you, I know that typically when I've taken a look at uh, Docker Slim, they've said that uh, if you use a compiled language, you're going to see a lot more reduction in terms of size. Just you know, a curiosity question: How what is the biggest delta you've seen in terms of like file size reduction? Ooh, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think the uh, biggest one I've seen is when we worked with our containers. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, uh, that was a 1.2 gigabyte container down to 200 megabytes. Wow, yeah. incredible. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if Kyle Quest, the creator, has any other yeah, he, examples. He bet, I know I've seen on the order of like 60 or 70x, but um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you definitely get some pretty small ones. So it's, it's interesting to take a look at the space around you know cloud native build packs and Docker mm -hmm. Slim and and kind of you know I wonder if we'll get to that point where we'll be able to kind of chain all of these things together but uh, and and you know just have like oh yeah it's just it's just a kilobyte uh, yeah. yeah you know to ship around <laughs> so that'll be yeah fun. yeah we actually so we talked a bunch with the build packs folks at KubeCon and you know you can run Docker Slim on build packs built containers you don't get as much um, out of them because they're sort of optimized uh, already but. With the Slim platform, you know, you can like look inside, and it's it's very interesting to me to see how those containers are built because they tend to be built a little bit different than like if you were just running a Docker file. And so, yeah, we're we're talking a lot with them. We actually just uh, published a blog post about working with build packs. I think they're super cool. We'll probably do an example on Twitch with them. So, um, yeah, that's a cool technology, and I think it's complementary to the things that we're thinking about and doing. So, that's exciting.
Are, are there any kinds of, I know it's, you know, obviously it's always best to kind of focus on the workflow over the tools it, the, themselves, but are there any other tools or practices or anything like that that you, that you, that y'all might add to the pipeline or just kind of find interesting on the horizon at all? Oh, we've lost Pete. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're obviously looking to improve these all of the, all of the time. Um, and, uh, we've got, uh, a number of things in the works at the moment. One is, um, integrating a GitOps workflow into this sort of minification process and, um, operating minification over a group of containers via, uh, Docker Compose. So you can... It more common is that you have several containers that operate a microservice in harmony and you want to be able to have a new revision of one of those containers in that collection and be able to minify it, but then test and validate it against the other containers that it, it relies upon. So we're, that's, uh, we, I think we put a blog post up about that last week. Um, so yeah, we're, um, you know, that's one, one change that we've got, which I'm quite looking forward to because, uh, I love that GitOps workflow, you know, being able to tag and mark things in a familiar way, but operate that on a whole collection, I think is going to be cool. Absolutely agree. No, I can't wait to see that. Those, I, I always really like to see the GitOps workflows. It's nice that, you know, at this last, uh, was it GitOps con and, and KubeCon, uh, we kind of got that formal definition of what is GitOps, you know, so we can kind of rally around that definition. So yeah. uh, definitely one of my favorite workflows too. It's nice to be able to have that rather than, you know, we do things a little differently around here at every company you work at. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, we, we've been working with uh, Payment Works, who are sort of a design partner, and they have been helping uh, fleshing out, you know, how that whole GitOps workflow should function. And they're already making good use of it. But that's a feature that's behind closed doors at the moment that we'll be unveiling uh, very soon. But we do have a white paper out that explains exactly what we've been working on and what's coming uh, coming along soon. So you can find that on the Slim AI website and also you'll find links there to our YouTube channel where we did uh, a lengthy interview with four of their dev team about that whole process because they were moving from monolithic VMs to a microservice architecture at the same time as moving to, you know, this this GitOps workflow all powered by the stuff that we're building. So it, that was a, a fascinating conversation. That's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah, I'm excited to see all, all, the, all the efforts made on those fronts. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't see any more questions on that front, but uh, definitely want to thank you all for watching today. Uh, gentlemen, if you have any parting words or, or words of wisdom to impart on the audience, I uh, would love to turn it over to you before uh, I, I close things out here. Uh, I guess I'll just say, um, you know, we're, we're a pretty friendly bunch. We like talking about containers and stuff like that. So if you come to slim.ai, you'll find links at the bottom of the page to our Discord channels and our Twitch stream and all that. So please just come chat with us, hang out, let us know what you think, let us know, um, you know, if we can make improvements and, um, yeah, it's just, it's been fun to be in this space. And so looking forward to, to all the cool things that we're going to do with CNCF and all the, the, the great projects that, that CNCF is doing. So yeah, Martin, what about you? Um, yep. All of those things. And, um, tomorrow we'll be on our Twitch channel twitch.tv slash slim devops that will be at 3 p.m eastern time 8 p.m gmt we're going to run through a version of what we've done today we're going to expand a bit more on that http probe stuff we had somebody in our community where we ran into an issue where their container wasn't being fully stimulated so we're going to circle back and try and find a more comprehensive set of probes to actually automate that stimulation of their container. So if you want to have a recap on this or dig into things in a bit more detail or have questions about what we've done today that we didn't get, get time to cover, then uh, come over and see us tomorrow. And at the Slim AI website, you can find a link to our Discord and you can always you know, message us in there and ask your questions and we'll, we'll follow up with you. 
Perfect. Well, thanks so much. I think, yeah, all I have to say is minify, minify, minify. Now I've got all the tools to do that. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It was great to hear from Peter and Martin around building, analyzing, optimizing, and securing containerized apps. Uh, we really liked the interaction and questions from the audience. It was a really lively bunch today. So thank you all for making it out, uh, you know, it, it, for we, for getting through all of the packets and everything like that. I know it can get a little congested from time to time. Uh, so we bring you the latest cloud native code every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. But next week, next week we're going to be off due to the American Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, we're going to kick off again on December 1st with Jason Morgan talking about Service Mesh 101, uh, an introduction with Linkerd. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks.